There is a great depth of migration data collected by international organizations, national governments, and global governance bodies like the United Nations. Let's continue this channel's discussion of migration data by looking at data sources about return migration, student migration, and the updated migrant stock data set provided by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, or UNDESA for short. If you're new to the channel, I encourage you to look at some of the earlier explainer videos about migration data, all of which will be linked in the description. We've previously looked at the different types of data available, such as administrative and survey data, in the Collecting Migration Data video, and then where to find data on migrant stocks and remittance flows in the video titled Where to Find Migration Data. Further videos on remittance data and the different ways migrants are classified for statistical purposes can be found linked in the description as well. Let's look at the data sources on another aspect of the migration experience, return. There are different types of return migration experiences and subsequently different data sources depending on how someone returned to their place of origin. In general, the UN's Migration Agency, or the International Organization for Migration, recognizes two main types of return, voluntary and forced. A common type of forced return is deportation, where a destination country's law enforcement expels a person with an irregular migration status, like we discussed in the Irregular Migration Explainer video. A migrant who is coerced to return, however, can also qualify as a forced returnee under UN definitions. Voluntary returns have a wide degree of variation, including those who return with some form of assistance from, for example, the IOM, with assistance such as cash transfers, vocational training, or reintegration assistance. Of course, voluntary returns can also be spontaneous, meaning they could happen for any number of reasons and not necessarily with the support from countries or organizations. Finally, there are instances where people are returned or repatriated for humanitarian reasons, meaning they faced a threat to their human rights in the destination country and needed assistance returning. Let's be clear, however, that these types of return are used in large-scale data sources, but academics in the field do debate whether these definitions completely capture the return migration experience. For the voluntary returns that IOM conducts, it also keeps data on returnees, including their demographic information, places of origin, and destination, plus more. The IOM's website for assisted voluntary return and reintegration contains a data section where you can access the most recent reports concerning return migration, but you can also access this data via the IOM's migration data portal. Feel free to check out the recent explainer video on this website's new user interface, linked in the description below. The data portal's Return Migration thematic page offers additional links to return data. For example, both IOM and UNHCR, so UNHCR being the UN Refugee Agency, collect data on repatriated refugees or those who were granted asylum and later returned to their countries of origin. You can find UNHCR's repatriation data by following this hyperlink from the data portal, selecting Data Finder from the menu bar, and then choosing Solutions dataset from the left side box. Finally, return data collection by national governments can be found on the same data portal thematic page. Note, however, that European data is collected at the regional level by Eurostat and Frontex, the European Border Security Agency. Of course, data on returns is only collected for non-EU citizens, or also known as third country nationals. Frontex publishes data indicators about both voluntary and forced returns in their risk analysis reports, seen here and linked in the description. Be sure to check the data portal's thematic page for links to other country-level sources. Next, let's look at data on student migration. While this group may not be the most obvious when it comes to discussing migration, international students typically qualify as at least 
temporary migrants under most definitions. Furthermore, they are sometimes studied by development scholars who are interested in reverse remittances. That is, cash that families send to their students living abroad, which is interesting since the migrants are the ones receiving remittances in this case. Since it is most common for countries hosting international students to collect data on these migrants at the administrative level, the most comprehensive data sources only describe student migration from the host country's perspective. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization compiles this data from a large number of countries. Their Statistical Institute's website contains information on both inflows and outflows of international students for each hosting country with available data. Use the search bar on the left side to find the term international student to see the data on these flows. Similar information about international student stocks for OECD member countries can be found on its website, which you can find linked below. Finally, let's look at the updated version of UNDESA's International Migrant Stock Spreadsheet. You may remember walking through how to use this sheet in an earlier explainer, but it's useful to revisit this large data source now that it's been reformatted. Remember that this data source is a compilation of nationally reported migrant stock data and some countries define migrants differently as discussed in the Classifying Migrants for Statistical Purposes video. There are some codes in column E signifying these different codes. Code B shows that anyone born outside the country is counted as a migrant. C indicates that anyone with a foreign citizenship is counted as a migrant. R means that refugees or persons in refugee-like situations are also counted. And finally, there's I, which means that there is no clear data for a country's migrant stocks, so the numbers are imputed or estimated values. In some country cases, it is possible for multiple codes to be used such as when UNDESA indicates that both foreign-born people and persons in refugee-like situations are included in the total migrant stock. With the new format, there are now columns for both destination and origin countries. This means that there are multiple lines for each destination, one for each origin region and country from which the destination currently hosts immigrants. Let's practice by looking for the number of Afghan immigrants living in Sweden in 2020. First, look at the destination column and scroll down to Sweden. This section starts on line 22,321, so don't worry if you feel like you've been scrolling for a while. It's normal for this data set. Once we get to the Sweden section, we look in column F for our origin country of interest. In this case, it's the first non-bolded origin, meaning we're switching from origin regions to countries. Now let's follow this line along until we get to the total international migrant stock for the year 2020, which is labeled along the top. This cell here contains the stock of Afghan immigrants living in Sweden in 2020. We can keep scrolling to the right to see 2020 values broken down by male and female in the sheet as well. Finally, note that the data code here, B, means we're seeing the number of people living in Sweden who were born in Afghanistan, although the code R for people classified as refugees or in refugee-like situations is absent here. I hope this video gave you some more direction with regard to where to find the best current information about international migration. Please be sure to leave your questions about migration data in the comments and give the video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to never miss this channel's weekly videos. See you next time.